Thanks for your patience, guys. We're just waiting for the online connection. Okay, it looks like we are live. So we'll just wait a few minutes for our online viewers to join us. But thank you all so much for joining us in person here at the Siena Art Institute. Yeah, come on in. Uh, so we're here tonight for our conversation with Emily Ginsberg, who is not only our guest this evening, but she's also our current resident artist here at the Siena Art Institute. She's helped us to kick off our spring semester here, and it's actually now already her final week with us. So this talk gives us a chance to uh, not only see a glimpse into her artistic background, uh, but also to have the special opportunity for our in-person audience to have an open studio after the presentation. So we'll have the chance to see some of the projects that she's been working on during her time here in Siena this past month. So um, as we start to have some online viewers joining us, um, I'll just mention we really welcome uh, comments or questions from our viewers. For our online viewers, feel free to use the comment section to um, ask any questions that we can respond to during the talk. So it's very much my honor to introduce tonight's speaker, Emily Ginsberg, who was born in New York, New York, and received her BA in art history from Trinity College in Hartford, Connecticut, my home state, I'm biased. <laughs> so, and um, she received her MFA in printmaking from Michigan's Cranbrook Academy of Art. Her conceptually driven work maps the effective impact of everyday communication transmissions through diverse media. These works have been exhibited nationally and internationally, as well as commissioned for public art projects at Seattle, Seattle City Light, Seattle, Washington, the Portland State University, the Cyan PDX in Portland, Oregon, and also recent exhibitions include Hard and Soft at the Congress Yards Projects and New Ownership at the UTS. Utetstic um, Gallery. Her work has been published in Data Flow, The Map as Art, and projects have been reviewed in Art Papers, Art US, and The 22 Magazine, amongst others. Her research involves explorations into human behavioral patterns and how meaning is perpetually entangled with mass media platforms. Her work manifests through painting, drawing, print media, objects, installation, animation, video, and sound. She's currently a professor and chair of the BFA programs at the Pacific Northwest College of Art in Portland, Oregon, and the department head of the Intermedia program, as well as faculty in the MFA Visual Studies program. So again, we really welcome your questions and comments, both from our in-person audience here at the Siena Art Institute, as well as for our online viewers. So without further ado, I will mute my microphone and we can turn the stage over to Emily Ginsberg. All right. Thank you so much, Lisa. Um, it's really wonderful to be here. I'm trying to forward my slides and they're not forwarding. It's not forwarding. It is not. No, just, you know, just for fun. Yes. Do the space bar. Go back. Otherwise we can try the PowerPoint instead. Let's see. There's always some technical difficulties. <laughs> Hmm. It won't really Let me just um, unplug here just for a second. Sure. That might be the trick. Here's your patience, guys. <laughs> and there's that gonna... Oh my goodness. It's like frozen. It's, it's yes. Hmm. This is the PDF, right? It should, be. It should be fine. Yep. Oh. Okay, now it's going. It just was being cantankerous, so, so okay. okay, all right. I'll start with that one. It's a good one. Let's see if this wants to communicate. All right. Mm -hmm. Fingers crossed. All right. All right. Yay. Yay. Um, so thank you all for coming to, to my talk. Uh, I just want to start off by really thanking uh, profusely uh, the people here who have supported uh, the residency, my time here, all of the logistics. And um, so thank you to Lisa, Notkin, Judy, Jackie Toon, Bernardo Giorgi, Miriam Grottinelli, Chris Baskin, and uh, Pacific Northwest College of Art, um, my uh, uh, place of employment back in the States that uh, supported me to be on a sabbatical this semester. So very, very pleased uh, to be here. Um, I 
I have a couple different things I want to do. I want to kind of give you a little bit of context to work that I've done before uh, I came here. And then I actually have, you know, with my phone, uh, documented the work that I've done here. So I'm also going to show you what I've been working on um, here as well. And then again, like Lisa said, for those folks that are in person, I would love for you to come upstairs and, and check out um, uh, what's in the studio. So I just want to kind of give a little overview of some of my interests. And I know Lisa did a bit of that as well, but you know, just that I'm looking at mapping, tracking, and tracing everyday life, patterns, systems, social dynamics, cause and effect, relationships, interdependence, complexity, emotion, ambiguity, sensation, play, and experimentation. Um, I wanted to start off um, with some work that I did over 10 years ago uh, from a series I called Social Studies. And these are all um, digitally uh, drawn an illustrator for those people who would be interested in, in process. And this was a body of work that really um, uh, utilized um, silhouetted images, flatness, the diagrammatic um, to map and trace aspects of our everyday life. Um, and, you know, worked with like systems of plumbing, electronics, refers to comics, architecture, model airplane kits, you know, just, just all these kind of bits and parts that make up our everyday um, experience. And I was looking also using kind of familiar objects as they are, but also working with uh, kind of combining different forms and inventing things and kind of creating multiple levels of, of um, interpretation within one form and sometimes dealing with maybe uh, things that might have like multiple function as well. So there's, there's all this kind of, uh, kind of reverence and, and, and sort of experimentation from, from things that we hold as, as familiar. And um, this is this kind of like this toolbox of, of things that make up our everyday life. And so that was that piece that I just showed you was part of a series that it's really very personal, you know, kind of drawing from my own experience. And then um, a couple years later, I was commissioned through the city of Seattle to do um, a permanent public installation for their electric utility. And so this is a screen printed piece on um, a, a enamel panel, like the, the kind of material they use for signs. And um, this is like nine feet tall and 30 some feet long. So it's a really huge piece. Um, and for, again, you digitally curious or interested drawing people. I drew this, you know, on a little screen and I had, you know, had to keep zooming in and out kind of to build uh, this, this really large composition. So um, I'm really playing with the same ideas um, about these ingredients of everyday life, these different systems as metaphors for how we are kind of interconnected, um, these systems that we rely on. And, um, uh, but I'm using it as a metaphor this, in this case, to really talk about the things that we rely on to function in our everyday life, the systems that really kind of carry us um, through work, through our home life. Um, and again, playing with multiple levels of interpretation and combining forms and being kind of playful and inventive, in addition to kind of anchoring you very much in things that you know from your everyday experience. So, Excuse so that. Me. Where, where is this? This is in this? Seattle. Yeah, but what, what, what building is it? It's in C, um, Seattle Municipal Tower. It's on the 36th floor of Seattle Municipal Tower. And it's, um, there are seven floors in that building that are dedicated to uh, public commissions that are for the city's electric utility. And, and I'm actually glad you asked a question because this floor was where all of the electrical engineers worked. And they, they were like very um, amused, I think, by the visual vocabulary that I was using. And of course, my understanding of these things is very basic. And I was, you know, I'm sure whatever I was doing wasn't gonna work, you know, it wouldn't turn on, it wouldn't, but, but I, was, I was riffing uh, on, on that. Um, and so I appreciate that the audience for that 
um, piece um, had had a kind of engagement with the visual vocabulary that I was using. Um, uh, another public project I did uh, a year later was for Portland State University. And um, this is on a main sort of outdoor thoroughfare um, uh, where the university is in, in Portland, Oregon. And uh, this set of some different kind of challenges to it than the kind of pedestrian back and forth context of that indoor piece. You know, when you work outside, you have to deal with engineers, contractor, not, yeah, architects, um, you've all these kind of issues you have to sort out with material and how it's going to hold up, you know, all of these different kind of elements, plus your materials and fabrication budgets and approvals and all of these moving parts. Um, and so, and the budget was actually, you know, fairly, you know, uh, spare, I will say. And, uh, but it's like, how can I maximize the impact of this? Um, how can I really look at the university as a place of learning and thinking about really being a student and kind of moving back and forth between thinking and communicating and, you know, living and working and all of these components and, and kind of using this metaphor almost like, like a streetcar because each one of these uh, forms is kind of tethered like trams are, you know, too. Uh, does that make sense to people? Um, so, so I was kind of thinking about the, this perpetual movement um, back and forth along these, these paths. Um, and again, bringing a lot of that same um, vocabulary and, uh, you know, kind of conceptual framework um, to, to this project. Uh, it's, it's uh, definitely like a a different mindset when you're working explicitly for a public space, you know, like that past piece, I had to think about a bus, like what you see on a bus, what you see in a car, what you see on a streetcar, what you see on a bike, what you see in a, you know, what you see walking and like different levels of graphic impact, engagement, how you're gonna kind of grab people from all those different um, places. And I think that I, I kind of wanted to take it back a little bit more intimately. And um, this was uh, um, uh, this piece, uh, which I started in 2013, um, called If You Felt the Same. Uh, these are stills from an animation that I also uh, made prints of where I, I basically mapped my mood. I wore a mood ring. I'm a, I'm a 70s uh, child of the 70s for anyone who might resonate with that. Um, and so there's a kind of, you know, speculative pop kind of culture aspect to, to this. And, you know, the, the, the sort of experiment was to wear a mood ring every day and, and sort of check my mood once a day for, you know, over the course of the year. And so each, you know, circle, like, like rings, you know, tree rings, whatever is one day. Um, and the animation kind of zoomed in and out over a period of that year. And that was just one part of this project which um, morphed into some other elements. And um, on the left, you can see that um, I made a spinner. And on the right, I basically used the code, the color codes and the emotional things that are attached to mood rings to create a twister floor piece. Do you know, twister? And so um, it actually could be played. You know, you could spin it and you can, you know, make you know, you put your body, so it's like up connecting emotion to like physical activity and um, however speculative we wanna, uh, you know, agree that this is, it's still kind of an invitation to, to that. Um, so it went from, you know, this, this project first being to like an, an exhibition and a gallery exhibition with the animation to um, also having, you know, these digital prints to then having this, floor piece and the spinner. I also had little cards that were embossed, blind embossed with the text, if you felt the same. So on the front of the card was this code and on the back, so it was kind of this tactile kind of private takeaway. Um, and for people who participated in the project, they could also have one where they kind of noted their own 
spins, I guess, um, as a, as a takeaway. And ultimately, um, a variation on this project got purchased uh, as part of another public art project in an elementary school and for the state of Washington. Mm -hmm. And I was really excited about that because I think pedagogically, you know, it creates an opportunity for think for, for young people to think about the relationship of color to emotion and just to be checking in a little bit with um, that aspect of themselves. So I think it, 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 it has a nice home in that way. And I think it has other kind of ways it can operate as well. So, so that's kind of an ongoing um, idea. So um, I wanted to uh, kind of shift to some of the other kind of concerns and other moments more kind of getting to more current uh, work and trying to think about time and keeping this moving. Um, so basically, you know, you saw this incredible range of digitally generated, di digitally fabricated work. And I also am an educator and an administrator, and I spend a lot of time at the computer, and it started to just not feel so good. And, and I was like not feeling in my body, and I, and I, and I thought, I, I am interested in all of these aspects of technology and systems and all of these things, but I need to kind of like filter it through my own physical body a little bit more. And so I really um, shifted my practice, kind of maintaining those aesthetics, but kind of remaking them in my own hand. So thinking about mass media aesthetics, glitch, and, you know, affect emotion, and, and sort of how these um, uh, kind of patterns and systems kind of reverberate uh, in us. Um, there's an enormous body of work that that kind of went between the last image I showed you and this one, you know, the last artwork. Um, but just to say, I have a very um, prolific work on paper practice, um, and uh, I think for 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 this piece, um, I was able to um, deal with modular format accumulation and then kind of creating um, a structure uh, for it, which in this case was the actual scale of a highway billboard. Um, and it was a place for me to kind of have this index of all of these kind of um, uh, patterns and rhythms and um, uh, um, codes that are part of um, how we receive information and constantly, you know, in all of these different platforms. So cross analog and digital platforms, it's like a laundry list of, of all of those things. And um, the title of this was called Transmission Reverb. And, and it's, you know, these works on paper, almost a hundred of them um, lining uh, this, this wall and framing it um, with spotlights in, in in the open spaces. And when you look at billboards from the highway, there are lights kind of shooting up at, to illuminate um, the, the image. And I'm illuminating the open space as, as a way of both giving your eye a resting place, but also thinking about like what sticks with us, you know, and, and these things that kind of just hover at the edge of our awareness and, and just kind of uh, how that yeah, how that hangs around in our in our minds and scaling it to the body so that you can kind of experience it um, in that way. And these are details of some of these in individual kind of uh, sections. Some of them are incredibly labor intensive and layered, and some of them are very streamlined, you know, dealing with dot matrix and pixels and um, barcodes and all of these kinds of um, graphic um, cues, uh, but again, using painting um, as opposed to uh, a screen, uh, a computer screen or other tools. Um, another, another kind of aspect of this level of kind of abstraction, I guess I want to say, um, was uh, this other part of the, this exhibition <clears throat> called Transmission Thresholds, which really like broke down, you know, that <clears throat> billboard piece had all of these codes, you know, all of these patterns. 
And this really breaks it down to CMYK and RGB. <clears throat> and those are the codes that we, <clears throat> excuse me, rely on um, to make meaning, you know, to sort of give form um, through these complex, you know, interlacing um, mechanisms of the page, the screen, you know, et cetera. Um, and so also thinking about it as a filter and how it impacts kind of what we see. So it was this kind of porous membrane between in inside and outside space in the context of the exhibition. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I also made a body of paintings just to know that, so you know, there's also like huge body of um, work on paper that's similar to this, but these were paintings on panel. Um, and this one's called More Than Meets the Eye. And uh, it's, um, you know, 44 by 30. And again, kind of bringing all of that vocabulary um, into a sort of discrete pictorial um, self-contained piece as opposed to parts that make up a larger um, concept. And, you know, thinking within this, like, where do these things meet the body somehow? Like, what are the different ways that all of these things we take in, how do we process them? And where do they, how do they move through us? You know, how do we make sense? And, and it was at a time when I didn't think we were making much sense about a lot of things. Um, There's a lot of absurdity um, to that and play in that billboard piece because of the politics of the time, you know, there are all these different kind of um, conditions that were just kind of like, I don't know, this is ridiculous. You know, I don't know what to make of things right now. Um, and then COVID hit and uh, everyone was at home all of a sudden. And I decided right at the beginning that I was going to be an artist in residence in my house. I knew I was gonna be working from home <clears throat> And I thought, okay, what, what can I do with that? Um, so I kind of took some of that same modular structure that I'd used in the billboard piece, and I started kind of generating patterns and things that related to my experience um, of this time, of being a home, of like, you know, the blue and, and uh, there's two shades of blue here. It's like Amazon. How many, how many of us were like, had the Amazon symbols like burned into our brain, um, you know, other things that were like kind of related to um, sense of germs, um, sort of shifting ideas about proximity that we all had to each other. And, and I was, you know, ideas of safety and caution, you know, like became these graphic codes. Uh, and so I, I would play it around with these things and I move them around in different ways. And this is in my studio at home. And I kind of fell upon this idea of them as floor plans, like thinking about my living space and, and, and this experience. Um, but there was nowhere to show, you know, no one was going inside anywhere. And I just like, okay, that was in my studio that lived in my studio. But I wanted you to, you know, I, I like working through this time was was significant. Um, then I moved into a body of work um, that were I call meteorites, and then I've called them time capsules. And this was kind of uh, in response to a, a sense of of again of of kind of complexity and uncertainty. And, and I started looking around at what resonated with me and my, my uh, husband, Chris Baskin is, is, a, is a potter. There's lots of bags of clay around the house, in the studio, in the garage. Some of it is like dried out. Some of it is gonna get used, you know? And I started looking at them. I was like, oh, that's like, I started responding to them. And I started thinking about them, you know, um, you know, geologically and, and, and as entities. And, and I thought, oh, you know, this is a way to kind of reflect what it feels like right now. Um, and, and I, I did things like, um, 
I drop them out of the second floor of our house to smash clay. I, um, you know, smash them with tools. I pound it stuff on the ground. If you go on my Instagram, you can see I'm like pounding. I'm laughing because it's just kind of ridiculous. Um, but it was it, it sort of uh, um, made made sense to me. Uh, to sort of bring my conceptual and graphic concerns to glazing. And, you know, there, there are so much about fragmentation and juxtaposition in a lot of the work that you've seen prior to this. And it was sort of taking that and kind of, you know, uh, wrapping it around um, objects and sort of being able to sort of have it become more bodily um, and thinking about, you know, organs, signals, noises, um, these kind of fossilized tangles of sensation um, as a kind of gut feeling of, of, of the time. Uh, so I started making these um, and uh, I... Do you go first with painting on them and then you glaze them? I, I paint them with underglaze ah. and then they get fired. They get bisque fired. I'll back up a second for process interest. These are like, some of them are 40 to 50 pounds of, of clay that would just get thrown out. or are just gonna be thrown out. And so in order to use them, uh, they have to dry out for several months. And for people who are traditionally trained in ceramics would say, you can't do that. You can't fire solid things like that. It doesn't work, they'll blow up, it doesn't work. But because my husband is very knowledgeable about clay, he's like, no, you can dry it out. You know, so, so they dried out for about three months, then they got bisque fired, and then I did the glazing, and then we glazed fired them. So, yeah. Um, and I think this is a good example of, of this, this kind of sensation that, that uh, I felt at the time. These are, these are pieces that are made up of that, those parts that were you know, um, broken and, um, and then dried out and then uh, glazed. And this was a rooftop installation as part of um, the hard and soft exhibition that um, Lisa mentioned. And I really was thinking about, pardon my French, but like shit flying, you know? It's like, this is what it feels like right now. And so uh, these were kind of uh, on the roof there was another piece in a fire pit and another piece in a, in a garden bed. And it was just kind of like, look up, you know? Um, and, and so I just continued with this uh, series and I'm gonna move a little bit quickly through them. Um, and uh, just so you get an idea, this is an ongoing body of work and I'm gonna be uh, having an exhibition in, this, uh, in, in the fall at Southeast Cooper Contemporary in Portland, where these will be um, exhibited. And, and also they're on my-, how on big my are they? Excellent question. They're, I would say uh, they're no larger than 12 inches all around. They're like between eight and 12 inches. So they feel like, you know, you can you carry them they're heavy, but you can carry them and they definitely are scaled to the body in that way. And I, you know, just would say, you know, I'm, I'm looking at like interiority of the body. It's a little, little, little uh, raw and visceral. I'm also thinking about glitch, but I'm also thinking about like dazzle ships you know, and camouflage and and um, these different things that relate, which for me also resonated with architecture here and things that I kind of um, was drawn to about Siena. This is a, a piece that I just finished before I came here. These haven't been, none of these have been shown. As I, I just want to mention that, you know, as they became time capsules, I really think about them as, as sort of registers for my own experience and how I'm processing things, like thinking about biological processing as well as neurological and emotional processing. 
and um, you know things that are kind of all in that mix, all kind of uh, synthesized um, and uh, like a tangle or not, but but you know functioning. It's like I'm interested in complexity, but but still making it legible. You know, it's not uh, impossible to to look at. Uh, then I came here and um, uh, I had proposed in, in, in my thing and my uh, proposal to for the residency to really make use of of the power of um, Lorenzetti's allegory of good and bad government of the architectural patterning in the Duomo, Cini's painting, thinking about public space. Um, the impact of time on structures, walls, stones, bricks, site-specific work, walking, eating, looking, and listening. Um, and it was important for me uh, here to really like to loosen up, to uh, have a sense of play, uh, to say yes to, to things, um, but also to ask myself some questions and um, you know, looking at the history embedded in the walls and the variety of stone and brick uh, patterns, things that are cared for in an ongoing fashion that reflect time, rupture, repair, and resilience. I'm like, can I do that? You know, like, I feel like it's needed. It's needed personally. It's needed on these others, other levels, multiple levels. And so here's this kind of visual presentation around me that's significant of that. So like, can I, can I do that? Can I try? Um, um, looking at getting to see the, the good and bad government piece in person that's being restored, a once in a lifetime opportunity, which I can't believe how lucky I, I was to be able to do that. And to really think about historically about when things work and when they don't. Um, and to think about restoration as a process of repair. And, you know, the idea, I think I was talking with Miriam in the car about repairing the art and repairing the systems, you know, like some kind of connection between those things. And, and I'm like, can I do that? Can I try that? Um, and, you know, thinking about the, the richness, the aesthetic richness of, of Sienna thinking about uh, gestures of adornment and beautification. Um, you know, can I link color and pattern and gesture um, for the purpose of repair and resilience? Can I do that? Can I try that? Um, can I bring some ethics of materiality to the work I make here by choosing to work as much possible with what's on hand here? You know, like how can I do that? Um, and, and I entered kind of with those questions and with those kind of concerns and, and then just sort of thought, well, I'm gonna see what, what comes. And one of the things that resonated with me early uh, was Carnival. And, and I may not be saying that right even here, but I'm saying Carnival. Um, and it really resonated with my appreciation for the value of play, my love of color uh, and I kind of just kind of geeked out on confetti, um, to be honest. And it was like this message of joy, this like simple message of joy uh, that felt like it was sorely needed after, you know, the the, the sort of last number of years that, that um, many of us, all of us have endured different levels of anxiety, you know, in the different communities and settings that we're all in, the political turmoil, um, grief from loss in my family. And it was like, oh my gosh, look at, look at this like magic carpet that's covering everything in the compo. Um, and between that and the garden here and the birds were just like a tonic uh, for me and an invitation. And I brought, um, I brought paper with me and paint, but I was quickly drawn to objects, you know? And so I looked at the things that I could find. So stone, brick, concrete, asphalt were things that I found and collected as I walked around. And so what I'm gonna show you now is just like a collection of the different things 
that I made here. And uh, I gave myself, you know, permission to kind of grab these things. This is asphalt and concrete and a little rock mixed. And, it's, and, and so it's like, how can I activate these forms? How do I bring my sense of, of, of you know, the body, of, of, of signals, of, of these sort of things that are impacting us? Um, I spent a lot of money at Conad. And um, uh, so I, I started thinking about making my own billboard, like my own little like distressed billboards, you know, because everything's so compartmentalized and regulated where information, public information can live. And so I was like, well, how do I bring that into my own intimate kind of sense of experience? So I was like, well, this is my history here is, are, are these activities. So, so that was uh, satisfying. Um, this is a table uh, in my studio with a collection of the of some of the sculptures that I made just, just for context. Um, and I really, um, let myself, you know, not only use things like receipts, but, um, and, conf and confetti, um, but like food scraps and dust, my hair, you know, I was just like, I was like, oh, that's kind of gross. Oh, I'm going to use that. <laughs> you know, I was like, I can do that. Um, and I had this strong impulse to want to place my work somewhere here, you know, outside and, you know, I have this background with public art um, and I have all these other kind of concerns and I'm so aware of the history of, of this place and like, how am I going to do this? And I made, you know, these different sculptures. Oh, by the way, this one was during the earthquake. Um, this is the layout of the apartment upstairs and the uh, imagery on the right is kind of like seismic kind of graph patterning. Um, uh, and that was my way of registering um, that experience. Um, in any case, I'm, I'm thinking, how can I, I'm still dealing with this complexity and these multifaceted kind of forms and um, bringing all that same kind of consideration to those time capsule pieces. And I'm like, where can I put them? I wanna take them outside. And I went outside, I became fascinated with when walking around with um, the historic idea of the loophole, which is those pass-throughs that were used for military purposes, for protection and defending and things like that. And also the sort of um, grid of squarish kind of openings uh, that you can find in a lot of the walls um, that were part of the just building process and they're, they're open. And I was like, yes, those, those are really, you know, it's like, that's a place to leave messages or it's a, it's like, there are these niches. And um, uh, I, 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 I kept making the sculptures and I, um, I let myself even, you know, re-engage with like pictographic and graph, you know, silhouetted images and things. Uh, so it was, again, this kind of uh, open inventory of, different materials and processes, um, including letting myself make drawings um, with confetti that I collected off the ground in the compo. Um, so these are some of those, kind of dealing with my interest in tangles and knots and just kind of like fixing them and gluing them down to a surface as a sort of drawing practice. This is me sorting through the diamond shaped things and then making drawings. These are all upstairs for those people here. Uh, another thing that I did before I get to what I figured out about how to deal with my objects outside is um, my husband, Chris Baskin, is a functional potter and he made a series of unomis, which are Japanese tea bowls, right? Drinking yes. vessels. Drinking vessels. Not specifically yes, bowls. not Drinking specifically tea bowls. bowls. Um, anyway, so uh, it was an opportunity to work with him. We've done some collaborative things and for me to kind of do some mark making on these while they're still kind of leather hard um, by, there's like a slip that's applied to the surface and then you can <coughs> kind of scratch through. For any of you carvers, printmakers, 
it's it's sort of very friendly to to those kind of responses. So I wanted to just show that. Um, so I want to get to this is my last thing, and I, I have a few more minutes. Um, uh, that I I really again I want how do I how do I how do I add to a conversation that's around me? How do I do that? And I took some of these sculptures that I had made, um, not these, um, and I, I put them in these niches um, in the wall along the garden. I had decided that, that wall along the garden was a, you know, the old city wall was a really um, kind of brought together my interest in, in those ideas of, of history and time, um, my feeling of the garden as this kind of like, again, this kind of tonic, um, and my um, experience with, with color and pattern and things I was seeing both, you know, in the confetti and in the paintings, you know, it's like, how can I bring these things together? Um, but to say, I started off, and you'll see these objects upstairs, I took them, I went outside, and I put them in the little niches, and they went, they just disappeared. The walls are so the patterns, like everything is so strong that it just, it's like, it's fighting. It's fighting with, it's its too much complexity with what's already there. And so I had a really um, wonderful studio visit with Bernardo and, and we talked about, I'm like, can I do something? How can I do this? And he was like, yes, let's, you know, let's see, if you, you know, let me check with so and so and so and so. Yes. So uh, I basically thought about it and I thought, I really need to think not about this space, which is probably over 150 feet where the garden is, um, as, as an exhibition space, but as a project site. And, and so I really just kind of streamlined my thinking down to color and to objects and to really thinking about creating something that was like a score, a walking meditation, a kind of conversation with birds and stones and plants, you know, and, and the people that move through the space and how, how they can kind of um, uh, be in dialogue with each other in this environment. So I made over 50 of these, um, uh, um, pieces that I collected, broken uh, bricks, concrete, some stones, and painted them, and then went through the process uh, over the weekend of placing them in these niches uh, all along um, the garden wall. So that's that's a screenshot from, from my uh, phone, but I thought it was nice because it shows you 40 of them and the different ways they were placed. Um, and they're temporary. They're, they're, they don't impact or damage or anything, the structure. They're, so they're kind of a gentle um, gesture, but they also pop and, and they can kind of uh, help move your eye around uh, between you know, the plants, the sky, everything, um, as you kind of occupy that space. And um, I'm going to try and do my escape, um, the cone, and then the full screen. Yeah. Um, I just, I have videos that are much longer, but they were too big for, to kind of get them on to show. And so really this is just about kind of a standing still position, looking and listening. The birds, the birds, what can I say about the birds? Whoop, it's looping, it's stopping. So I am gonna um, kind of extend this, I think with a few more of these forms to kind of as the walking pattern through the garden gets kind of um, further developed uh, by the community here uh, from what Bernardo uh, explained to me. And um, also looking to have one of my 
sculptures that's a little more complex um, embedded into the one of the, the low brick wall that's uh, coming down into Il Punto. Um, so those are things that are kind of still going. So it's been really spectacular for me to be here. I, I've gotten so much out of it and um, feel just so um, appreciative of it. And um, I hope for whoever's here, please come up and look at some things in the studio and I'd love to chat. Um, and uh, I'm certainly happy to answer any questions. So thank you. Thank you so much, Emily. I think there's been a lot of really positive comments with our online viewers. Okay. I don't know if there's any questions just before we head upstairs and dive into some refreshments for our in-person audience. Yes. Mine is just a comment. I love the way what you've done there is both very respectful of the structures and really makes you makes you appreciate and think and appreciate again and think again. Love it. Thank you. Yeah. Not, not every Thank you so much. We can just <laughs> chew and chat. <laughs> Um, I'll just um, mention for our, um, our viewers, um, this is the first of our spring series of talks. So um, at the same time, next week we'll actually have a presentation of our incoming resident artist, um, Carol Elkovich. So um, do come back at the same time next week. Unfortunately, Emily and Chris are going to be heading off to other locations, but it's been so wonderful to have you both with us here this month. And thank you so much, Emily, for this wonderful presentation. And I'm really looking forward to going up to your studio and seeing yeah. in person the work that you've created. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.